Okay. Well, thank you all for being here. It's been a while since we had a live event. We've done some small poetry readings, but it's a joy to see so many people come out, masked and unmasked. I hope you all have a small tea. Um, just to welcome Professor Shilata Raman, who, as many of you know, is Professor of Hinduism at the University of Toronto, with her areas being in Sri Vaishnavism and Tamil Shaiva Siddhanta. Also delighted to have Professor Venkat Chalapati, Madras's very own staff at the Madras Institute of Development Studies. And thank you for coming in at such short notice and for the generosity of your time. We're also delighted that this event we are able to co-host with the Roja Mukhya Library. So thank you very much, Sundar. And we hope to do more together. Um, without further ado, just a quick reminder, if you can switch off those irreplaceable best friends that we can't live life without, and I'll do the same myself, because then my will just go off at the inappropriate moment. And uh, over to you, Srilata and Professor Lekha uh, Chakra. Um, thanks, Ramji, for introducing us. Uh, before we get this event started, uh, I want to start this evening's event by paying homage to Ovan Nadigal, the foremost scholar of Malala, who passed away the day before yesterday at the ripe old age of 90. It was a very long and illustrious an accomplished life. I think uh, a book like uh, Sri Lata's could not have been written without the foundational research done by Moon Medigan. So I suggest that we uh, stand up and pay for this too. This is uh, quite a crowd for a rather uh, serious book, but uh, it is pity because uh, Malala was probably one of the most genuinely popular cultural figures, was and is one of the most genuinely popular cultural figures in uh, Tamil Nadu. Yes, some of his songs and poems are sung being sung to this day without many of us even knowing that it is what it has it has permeated our language uh, I Subramanya Bhardhya actually called him Tamil Arathil Udhiya Vedipil Uno he gave this status only to two people who was what it has Balalas was an extraordinary guy, as many of you know. He lived between 1823 and 1874. Uh, in a life of 21 years, he built institutions, he brought a new message, he made, a, he made an impact on the social, cultural, and religious life of Tamil Nadu, especially in the northern part. And most important, what uh, Sri Lata calls Ramalinga Redux. In the 19th and 20th century, he becomes a very key figure in modern town cultural life. From being a poet in a religious tradition, he becomes a figure in modern cultural life with the emancipatory and egalitarian message. Uh, so, uh, Varala has, right from his, from his own times, even though he lived only a brief 51 years, even in his own lifetime, for a man who rarely indulged in controversies himself, he became a controversial figure. 
That is one big chapter in Sri Lata's uh, book. But subsequently, was, he was picked up by various streams within Tamil cultural life. And to this day, he remains an important figure. And I think in recent times, you know, the, uh, the new DMK government has now uh, you know, uh, declared Thai Muslims of holiday. And Vallala is being, yeah, is being invoked repeatedly in recent times. That, of course, it has a long tradition. <coughs> right from the 1920s, when the self respect movement was begun. Vallala uh, was invoked in those times. So, all this will be discussed in this evening. There has been a lot of literature on uh, uh, Vallala in the last 150 years. Apart from the track wars, which uh, Sri Lata talks about, there has been a huge literature both in Tamil and English. In Tamil, was Uran Adigal following in the footsteps of Tolu Vela in Uriya and uh, Ha Balakrishna Pule. Now, to the present day where we have the groundbreaking work of uh, Saravana, who is here, please identify yourself. So, there has been a great amount of literature on uh, um, uh, two, two, three chapters in uh, Silatha's book are dedicated to Tribika and Maposi's interpretation and appropriation of uh, There has been writings in English also about uh, you make reference to Pandiganath and Subha And I also noticed that Parasu uh, Balakrishna, who wrote on Malala, both in English and Tamil, his niece is here. So, uh, Malala, as you can see, is very much part of our uh, cultural life, most unlikely to itself. There have also been academic studies, barely three years ago. Uh, another scholar of the history of religions, Richard Rice, in 2019, published a book called The Emergence of Modern Hindus, Religion on the Margins of Colonialism. So, there has also been great academic interest. But despite this huge volume of writings about Varna, uh, Sri Yata has written a book that genuinely breaks new ground. There is absolutely no, no doubt about it. And uh, without much further ado, I would uh, like to get the conversation going and I will I promise you that you know I will not speak too much anymore. The preamble has become very very long. It's almost as long as Valala's Tiruvadi Pugachi where it's only a supposedly a four line poem but each line contains 192 feet. So <laughs> I am not trying to emulate Malala, but at least in terms of length, uh, it is quite a long preamble. So, uh, first congratulations on writing what I think is a very important book. Deeply researched, uh, breaks new ground, uh, tries to shift uh, uh, the attention of both scholars and uh, general readers from what has been a certain, what I appreciate, but what I believe is a genuinely positive new and appropriation of Mandana, but as a very serious intellectual enterprise, I first commend you on writing this book. So, why did you set about writing this book? Or somebody who began your career? Uh, from the opposite end, so to speak, from Sri Vaishnavism to what we could call the mind field of uh, uh, cyber and cyber city on the videos. Um, thank you, fellow people. It's very kind to us. Um, so, uh, you know, um, as you rightly said, that I've been a scholar of uh, Sri Vaishnavism. And then, um, when one is in academia, uh, there are certain 
sort of um, uh, formal compulsions. So this was, I was in, uh, uh, still in the German academic world and I had done a doctorate, but in Germany, a doctorate is not sufficient uh, to particularly reach the professorial level. You do something called a habilitation, which uh, is a second doctorate. And when you do a second doctorate, it becomes really important that you do something entirely different to show that you're capable of a certain breadth, that, you, uh, that you're not very narrow in your interests. So it became clear to me that, you know, my comfort zone of Sri Vaishnavism, I would have to leave that and I would have to be thinking about what I might be interested in doing. And I was very clear, of course, that I was continuing to work on Tamil religion in some form or the other. And I had just uh, also been leaving and I had read uh, 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 V Gita and Rajadurais, The non brahmin Millennium. And in that, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, either there are about four or five pages on Balala and the Dravidian movement's interest in him. So I mentioned that to her, and she said, you know, it's time you did something very different. Why don't you think about Balala? And uh, he's such an interesting figure, she said. That's all more or less she said. And I said, uh, well, I don't know, let me see. And then I decided, let me take a look. I had no idea that some of the songs I'd learned as a child, you know, Vanathil Me, the Mahila Arakande, I had learned. Then the, one of the first songs I'd learned was Arula Ramude Sharanam Charanam. And I knew the songs, but I didn't know they were by Valala, as you rightly said, right? So then I said, okay, let me find out who this figure is. So, uh, the way it works, I came uh, one year in December on my, uh, uh, you know, what uh, annual holiday and I mentioned to my very beloved Periyama uh, who is no longer here, Shushila Padmanam, I said, I have to go to Badalu. She said, uh, oh, I know Kollachi uh, Mahalingam very well picked up the phone. She said, my niece is interested in Vadalud and Vadala. He said, I'm learnable over in it. I go there. He was an incredibly impressive person. Um, so he said to me, so, you Vadalud for me. You just go there. And in the context of that, he called his secretary, who came with the whole pile of Uranadigal works. Handed it to me and said, Mother, let the party in the I said, let a party to me, but I go. <laughs> then I head off for Taipusam and Uran Adigal welcomed me. And then he said to me, Mother, may I go to and all that. So there's this huge gathering. It was very big. Lots of people had come. And then and unfortunately, I can't remember his name, but there was a young man. So the people were sort of pulling away, you know, one after another. And then to my complete horror, in the middle of this Uranarigal package me just you were kapra me a face in the Vallala. I was horrified. So I'm sitting there on the end of face of the NS and I'm sort of trying to cook up something in my head. This young man who was from All India Radio some local station, he stood up and of course uh, he began by reciting and then he gave a talk about Pasipini and Valala and it was a, it was a very, you know, it was in the best tradition of uh, Dravidian oratory. It was very beautiful. But even more impressive was the, you know, they were it was a huge, people were sitting on the ground, it was a huge tent, Shamyana. And the look on the faces of these, you know, very, seemed to me, look, simple people of complete, um, you know, love and reverence. And uh, anyway, after that, I blabbed something, but that was not the point. For me, seeing that, I said, why do I not know about this figure? And he has this 
profound impact. And this whole thing of Pasipini and all of this. And I said, and that was the moment when I said, yes, I'll have to work on Parlala. That's how the story begins, my story. So it kind of reminds me of you know, how Malala himself <coughs> began his public life. He has to take the message that his brother was supposed to give the evening lecture. He is unwell, so he cannot speak, but he goes there and ends up giving the lecture. So this happens in what this what was the Maramari Library for a very long time. In Mandari, Maramari Library, that is that used to be the Sumu Chakra. Yes. That's where Olala is supposed to have ah, first. Yes. So in a sense it's also Olala and Maramari. Right? So, so now tell me, how did you know about this? Because there is a, uh, what could we say, there is a vast literature on by Valala itself. Ah. So Valala was you know, lucky in that not only that he wrote a lot, despite his own disinclination, yes. in his own lifetime his work was published yes. and it was carried forward by Scholars, yes. you know, somebody like Bal Krishna Pillai, he didn't work from within the academic no. uh, framework. So, you have this huge literature and also the random work. Yes. So, can you tell us about how you began engaging with this literature? Yes. And uh, how did you negotiate this literature and how did you get into your particular kind of particular? So, of course, I first read the Tirumure. And it was clear that, uh, you know, uh, as uh, one of the most perceptive writers on Vandala, Raj Kautaman writes, you have the Shiva Bhakta, Bhakta in the first five uh, Tiruvarupa volumes. And of course, you see all the huge influence of. Uh, um, you know, starting with Trinyana Samandar, right, of Mani Kavasakar, and he pays homage to them. And uh, the poetry is extraordinary. Um, but it also comes in a lineage of extraordinary poetry. I mean, if you just take Tayumanavar and then you take Vandalar, it's all there. And then, um, you know, then I started, uh, then you come to Daritra and Jodhiyakaval, which is a whole different kind of work. But then I read all the poetry, I read uh, the prose writings. Um, and so I was very immersed in all of this. But I kept feeling that somehow I was not understanding them. I felt, and I read the secondary literature. I read uh, uh, Ura Narigar, who actually, uh, as I mentioned in the book, you know. Tamil Nadu has thrown up sort of basically one saint per street and the 19th century they proliferated but not everybody becomes a Valala and the reason for that is not just Valala, that Valala wrote so much but that he was very fortunate in he had very erudite uh, disciple like Tolgo Velai the Mandaliyar. He had a uh, then he had the great uh, Balakrishna Pillai who compiled the first thing and then finally he had Ura Nadira who, so you know, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's the way, um, you know, a dialect is a, is a language uh, with an army. Palala uh, was blessed in having people who uh, had the competence and the intelligence to understand him and to do great service. But uh, say that, um, these are times when people take offense at the top of a hat. I did find that particular comment that you know, uh, I make this. Uh, yes, tell me. That, yeah. Uh, Malala, because he had an army of publishers and editors. And yes, others. yes. And let me read it out. Yes. I hope others will also be sufficiently offended. <laughs> <laughs> these are the countless, almost families. Just like a language is a dialect with an army, the same who makes it into a lasting public memory is a person with more than one geography, a compiler, an editor, 
and perhaps an institution or two that continues to exist after her of you. But the difference is there in the very next slide. Uh, Ramlinga had all this, and it served him very posthumously. But what produced even more than poetic compositions? Splendid and lyrical as some of them are. So, probably you will be condoned then, but you need to take offense. But what I do want to ask you something it is this task of, you know, it's a, assume it's a laborious, yes. painstaking work. Yes. You have taken 10 years to write this book. and the and the to 20, 30, 40 years to do this. So, if what impelled them was not funding this. No. Right? Uh, national uh, no. humanities grants or anything. So, there's something with the Malala yes. that makes, makes them persevere, yes. work hard. So, can you say something more about yes. the intrinsic yes. Yes. value? No, but exactly. So, uh, I mean, you have all this extraordinary scholarship. And uh, I read as much of it as I could, uh, but uh, and but you know what uh, <coughs> grasps everybody's you know where they sort of uh, become Malala rights in a profound way is because of Jiva Karunya. There is no doubt, and uh, they recognize this as something extraordinary <coughs> in his uh, writing. Now, when I when I read Valalar and I ruminated on this, I still felt that I was not um, understanding that something was deluding me. Uh, I I I wrote an article. I think it was 2014 uh, or maybe 17. I forget the date. 15, 17. I forget on how Jeeva Karunyam and Vailala, we can understand it right from Mani Mehale, we can understand it from the Tirukural, uh, we can understand it in many ways. And I felt this was, uh, I was trying to do that. But in spite of that, and that's why the book took so long, I still felt, no, there's something I'm not getting. And until I get that, I can't write this, bring this book to fruition. And at that point, for some reason, uh, I think, uh, again, the gentleman is sitting here, M. Kannan. So, Kannan is somebody who always, you know, tries to provoke me or tell me, you know, give me some, what I sometimes think this is not relevant, it's not interesting information. And he gave me. Uh, uh, an article written in some fairly obscure journal which has gone out of print of Rangaya Murugan, which was on these Dalit uh, figures yeah. dotting the Tamil landscape. So I read that and then I thought, so in some way I have to understand Vallalar as a figure who is being informed. Uh, uh, in his religiosity uh, by actually, uh, you know, pre-modern Shaiva traditions. And it is not enough to only understand them as, you know, okay, he's men mentioning Pati Pashu Pasa but it's not enough to leave it at that. I have to really understand his intellectual genealogy in some fundamental way. So that's when I said, how can I do this? I said the clues might lie in why is he, what, what works was he interested in. And then I started looking at uh, the works that he published and which uh, he obviously took a deep interest in. And one of the first uh, works he published was Muttaya Swami Girls, um, Chinmaya Deepika, which is a Veera Shaiva. Tamil Veera Shaiva. Now, what is, I think, very much less known is the contribution since the 17th century of Tamil Veera Shaiva literature to the great stream of Tamil Shaivas. It is far less understood and explored. But once I read the Chinmaya Deepika, um, which is about 300 odd verses, 
um, I began to, um, it's opened up a portal for me. I said, uh, there are, Balala's interest in, you know, um, in a certain kind of uh, uh, Shiva Advaitam, in a certain kind of caste pretty, uh, it's there also in the Chinmayan. And that opened up the way for me to start looking at older works. And then, of course, then I said, well, I have to go back. 15th century, you can't do anything. And then I discovered uh, one of the great figures, again, who is not read now, Sikh Kari Sitra And uh, then I, uh, that's the journey. I began to see very clearly that Valala's Jiva Karunyam is already the idea of Jiva Karunyam as something which is an intrinsic quality of the Shiva Yoga is there starting already in the late 15th century and it is being talked about it is one of the qualities of the Shiva Yoga but the fascinating thing is what, what Valala then does with it he breaks the bounds of sectarianism, he breaks the bounds of, uh, uh, he, he, it's no longer about the, uh, it's no, no longer about Turavaram, it's not about the Shiva Yogi, it's about Illala, it's about how the householder must be, must have that same Jiva Kham. So that becomes the... Uh, uh, I'm glad that you, you, uh, you you spoke at length about this, but I want to push you a little further because for uh, people of my generation, probably an earlier generation as well, Balala was for us mediated by Kuruvika, Mahabhusi and the Travelling Movement. For us, Balala was all about Kanguri Varakamma, Mahabhuri, Mahabhuri, we are so, but what I find you know, the most interesting and challenging part of the book, but at the same time, something that causes some amount of uh, discomfort is also that uh, you squarely fit into this genre. Generally, we go up to time, not beyond. Yes. But now you go into back, in that case, the 14th, 15th century. Yes. Based on all these various debates about, should say, both uh, Saiva Siddhantam and also Virasam. Yes. Uh, so, what is the purchase that you get apart from, of course, historians? Historians are yeah. always obsessed with origins. Yes. yes. It does explain where it comes from. But does it exhaust? Well, what does it do to us now to know only his genealogy or emphasize this genealogy rather than see this transformation? None of these uh, uh, you know, great scholars that you mentioned, yes. are all very powerful yes. scholars, which require some deep training to understand yes. them. None of them set about to transform the world. They were only interpreting the world. Yes. They were not changing the world. This man. Actually, did yes. transform. Yes. How do you respond to yes. it? No, no, I think this is an important question because, in a way, uh, you know, um, well, one thing I would say is that um, there is a tendency, generally in the scholarship on the colonial period and particularly on religion in the 19th century, whether it's Tamil Nadu or anywhere else, to see these figures almost as kind of autochthonous geniuses who just sprung out of the, so to speak, and they are proclaiming important new doctrines. Um, I have come to the conclusion, and we can argue about this, generally, that particularly the figures of the first half of the 19th century, whether it's Ram Mohan Roy, and whether it's Valala, taking the bigger picture, that these are still people who are steeped in traditional education. They are not figures who are, they're not figures like Tirivika or Maposi, who sort of in a way have a kind of connection to the pre-modern, but they have in some ways broken decisively. 
but Vallala is still familiar with uh, the older uh, Shaiva works. So it seems to me that uh, you cannot do full justice. Just as an intellectual historian of the, uh, the uh, intellectual historian of ideas or whatever, without doing that. So that's from an academic point of view. I would say that uh, that was a that was in fact a driving passion in my case, which is if I want to understand where he's coming from, I need to be able to place uh, his uh, where where he is taking some where where his sources are. What does that do for um, what does that do for a popular understanding? Well, I think in the chapter on hunger and compassion, uh, there are two interventions that I make. One is I show that he takes this, but he radically transforms it. So it in no way, you know, it, it shows actually his remarkable capacity to take all that learning, but to also break with it. And uh, to place Jiva Karunyam in a kind of, um, of course there is, in the uh, Tamil Nidhi Shaivism, there is a strident a caste critique of a certain kind, but it goes nowhere near Vadala. And of course there is Jiva Karunyam, but Jiva Karunyam is that, uh, is part of a fourfold, uh, you know, very high, the qualities which only an enlightened Shiva Yogi has. But Vadala is saying Jiva Karunyam is that which is part of your very humanity. So he's taking it and he's doing something remarkable. I feel we can't understand the, the radicalness of his innovation without understanding what it's breaking from. Right? That is my point. But the second point I want to make, and this is really something I'm still grappling with, and I think you would be a, a you know, good interlocutor in this, is that uh, that part of the this is part of the genealogy of of uh, the Dravidian movement, and in a way, it it sort of I think it allows it to be to 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 sort of you know pull along with it uh, the long duree historical innovations that have happened within Shaivism, culminating in in Vadala. So in a way, it's like you know, you don't have to, you don't have to uh, necessarily say, uh, you know, that there was nothing in uh, Shaivism prior to Vallala, because that's not the case. But you can in fact see how complex it was, and then how we innovated. And I think, and at the final point I want to make is, and that's what's fascinating. You have a whole, uh, you have a range of what you would call Dalit figures in the 19th century. Isu Sachidananda Swami, right? And then, of course, Ayutthaya Das. They are also grappling with Jiva Kali. And, and they are coming up, uh, you know, they are as preoccupied with it as Vadala. And th this is a moment when. And, and, and then Valala becomes the person who, who does things with it, uh, which are possibly the most emancipatory and most fascinating. Uh, I'm telling you on uh, Ayodhya Serena. Yes. But uh, 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 in, uh, in Valala's rootedness in the Saiva Tamil tradition, but in negation of that, or the erasure of that, you seem to blame it on the 20th century appropriators of Bhagavad I will credit them with that. Yes. But the point is that in, uh, who pulls him out of, who does not give him place in the tradition? It is not Nyanya, Rinal, or Mahabhusi, or Trivika, yes. but it is a mainstream Shaiva tradition. That does not give place to yes. Valala, yes. which brings me to the uh, big track block. Yes. But uh, before that, but please uh, also recall that in, uh, in the 1920s and 30s, yes. 
and the cyber are challenged by the cybersecurity. Yes. The progressive figures are all those who have a different take on yes. Yes. Or Tilvika. Sami Chidambaranath, my father. Sachidam Nandita, like everybody. Yes. It is only when when do this uh, 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 world cyber bandit, yes. when do they actually accept Padala? It's only much later. Yes. Here I find you don't you know, make any mention of Padala Parasam if you guys come in here. Because. No. I mean, I've written, uh, in fact, I deal with the, uh, in the chapter on this, but I talk about Avedare Sami Pillai's commentary on the Tiruvarupa. Okay, yeah. So this is where, for the first time, the mainstream Tamil Shalimai Siddhartha's comment. Yes. Acknowledges. Yes. So it takes about 18, 19 years to do Yes. It. All through it, it is a history of rejection. Yes. And then, how can we say that his debt to or his rootedness in the Tamil Saiyan tradition yes. has not been So the root is on the other, right? Yeah, but uh, but Chandani, my answer to that would be I mean, it, it's true. The Shaita Siddhanta Maras have had a terrible role in the Rupa Manupa board. They rejected Varela. Um, this is a historical fact. Uh, they and they basically had nothing to do with it later, and it is precisely because starting with Oman Durar and post Oman Durar with the Javidian movement and with Sami Chidamarnath that he gets picked up and it begins to be valued. Uh, Vallalal himself clearly, and I point that out in the final phase, uh, as a result of that rejection, becomes the you know, decides, I'm, I'm willing to let that go. All of this is true. Um, and these are people and these are events that take place. The Dravidian movement's uh, sort of uh, recuperation of Vallalar as the kind of figure coming from Shaivism who was possibly presenting a way forward for some kind of uh, very progressive Shaiva religiosity is also, I think, uh, a recuperation which is uh, which is very positive and which I think I also point out. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that there has been in the long history of Tamil Shaivism, there have always been uh, figures, Kanuri Awalan is a classic example, who were not accepted by the mainstream necessarily, but whose works still speak to us. And and uh, it is no it is not a mere coincidence that Valala uh, publishes the Odevil Urukam. It's not a mere coincidence that he publishes Chinmaya Deepika. It's not a mere coincidence that the most profound doctrine of his come is coming from Kumara Devas to the Sadhana. So, uh, the fact of the matter is that in, I think it behoves uh, those who care about the long durée of Tamil literature to also recoup these works and to, to appreciate them in their own right, leaving aside Madhavi Padis, leaving aside uh, uh, what they did to Varana. Uh, because if we don't do that, um, we fall into the trap of actually not understanding the Tamil literary past and in, in its fullness and its richness and complexity. We may we, we just be content with looking at Sangha Ilatyam, Tirupural and Kamaramayan. But that is not enough. Tamil literature, I mean, has treasures like Sirkari Sitraval and Ariel that nobody necessarily looks at now. It has treasures like Adivira Ramaparnia's Tirukkarikai Kalikurai Andadi, which is a beautiful poem. Now, I feel passionately about this because I read this and I I see the greatness. Of course, I see the greatness of Tirukkuran, but this is also in its own way extraordinary. Uh, this poem is well taken. Yes. Uh, uh, our uh, 
more emphasis on Sangam literature. And as a counterpoint to it, the emphasis on the Kambaramani, yes. this point is well taken about this. Uh, intellectual uh, explorations should be diversified and continue. So, I just want to push you a little what you call not only the hegemony but the anti hegemony, yes. which is the next point. So, I find that your chapter, based on, of course, the stellar work that Saraman has done, yes. I'm lifting on these texts, you take it further. So, uh, how, how do you position yourself in the existing literature on the Alpha and Alpha? Because this is where you squarely take up the question of caste. Yes. The rejection by the various Saiva Adams uh, of Varnala is not because of some faulty uh, hermeneutics or faulty intellectual questions or faulty heretic uh, philosophical questions. Squarely boils down to his caste. Yes. Position. Yes. So, which is something that you have to talk about. Can yes. you say something? Yes. More so, more? of course, on the Malala comes, uh, as we all know, from the Karunigar. And though they, uh, the Karunigar thing, they're already writing 19th century, they're writing the Karunigar Purana. And they're claiming uh, an illustrious lineage, like a uh, lot of uh, groups in this period. Valhalla, uh, of course, is, uh, uh, you know, um, it's a combination because he comes from none of the, as, as I think uh, 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 Sri Sharvanan's uh, uh, work also shows, he doesn't come from any of the Pilema groupings which will actually can be Mara and stuff. And Arumuganavala's intervention there is uh, you know, decisive because Arumugana, so you know, there is also, as telepathy, you know, the 19th century is a fascinating period because you have these two or three Sri Lankan uh, Tamil figures who played an out disproportionately important role in the Tamil context. So Arumuganavala, Kadirve Pillai, uh, yes, these people, in fact, uh, formed in a way. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, modern Tamil research uh, and uh, all the Sangam stuff, but also, you know, what uh, where Shaivism should be going. And um, and it is, it is, a, it is as uh, thanks to um, uh, Trisaravanan's uh, uh, unearthing of this fascinating material, what we're seeing is uh, that uh, there is this, um, uh, there is this Varakta, there is all this. Uh, Condemning of Valhalla. Uh, and I think what I've uh, tried to show is Navala who critiques the British for certain ways of looking at, uh, you know, local uh, practices, at Shaivism, is deploying those same kind of ways of, uh, uh, you know, disrespecting Valhalla and, and treating Valhalla as, a, as a, a somebody who shouldn't be taken seriously. Uh, what was very important for me is also your work on the nature of the emergence of printing and copyright in this period because in a way uh, Navalan is now trying to pin down Valhalla uh, in ways which in, you, you do not do in the, uh, in the uh, Shaiva Ilekia tradition. So for example, if I'm, uh, if I'm writing that, uh, you know, Nan Odadunar name, which is now, Odalunardal is something that every uh, Shaivai to, uh, you know, person who feels, you know, who has the thing that they have Shiva Anubhuti and that they are writing, composing this kind of poetry has been saying forever. But now, uh, uh, Navalan is asking, every everybody saw him sitting with Ola Chugaris and, and studying, what is this Odalunardal? So, this kind of mocking which is being done is because uh, it is a new age and you can deploy new uh, new strategies of legitimization and delegitimization uh, copyright uh, you know authorship uh, if are you the author of this i mean if we now re read valala in, in with ideas of plagiarism we have to basically cut out about 80% of the Tiruvarupa 
because it has all the echoes of the entire Teva and Tirumurai, uh, Arunagiri Nath, Tavi Manavar, right? Uh, whoever else, but these are now being deployed by Navalar in a very problematic way uh, to, to, uh, to delegitimize Varadar. And it is being done only because of caste. So that's why you find that in to this day, Vallalar has not been able to break into the Sri Lankan Tamil, the Indian Tamil religious way. Right, yes. Well, you know, Una Nadigal had a, had a fascinating conversation with him in that visit. When I said, he said to me, basically he told me, Vandir Sudha Sanmargamad, Vandir Abhyayagur, that led Gardalurius was just uh, kind of this dusty little place. Omanurar Vandana Ella came to Khan. He got Pollachi Mahalingam's father took it up and then the whole thing took off. So I asked him, I said, Yedinala uh, Madri Vallala Vandana So he said, I'm a Madari Padiala Vishyam. But he said to me, you know, if you know anything about the basis of you can't vegetarian. He said, but Vallala comes from a community and a larger context where it's unthinkable to be vegetarian. So he said, so that's why even among his own community, his followers were very small because nobody wanted to turn vegetarian. I mean, he gave me this account of why it sort of collapsed after it. I don't, I found it fascinating. So, do uh, you still think that uh, some of the framing of the Arupa Marupa, the Black God, uh, continues to have an impact on how we see one another? I think it has, um, I don't think it has that impact in Tamil Nadu, where I think his, his greatness is sort of been enshrined. I don't think it has an impact, as I think it has the impact in your right about Sri Lanka and Tamil. Though, if I wrote an son wrote this marvelous work where he scolded his father for treating Valala like this. I thought of bringing it in the book, I didn't. Um, if I, um, wait, let me, let me wait. Um, then, uh, you know, the dismissal is gone that the Vedan Tamil scholars have for Vallala. Yes. This is uh, actually, I would say, revolting. Yes, yes. But Navalar also has uh, trouble reception in, in, uh, in uh, uh, Sri Lanka because he was, um, you know, for example, in the temple, temple entry struggles there, he was the reactionary. Vallala is much to criticize Navalar for. Yes. This is not his only. Yes. Yes. So, uh, how much time do we have? Another 10 minutes before we go to the discussion. Okay. So, just a couple of, uh, probably yes. the last part, which I think is once again a very uh, important part of it. The, the second part where you talk about Nyanya and Nikolo, yes. Trivika, and Makosi. I was thinking of it when I know we drove past uh, GRT, we find Makosi yes. uh, standing here. Yes. And uh, sometimes, you know, the passage of time sometimes uh, makes uh, some years more important than, than when they are actually what they were in their whole yes. lifetime. You find, for instance, Marcos now, 20, 30 years he's uh, died. Uh, his choice of Tamil icons yes. was so uh, non Sectarian in the sense of he, he, he celebrated vows, he celebrated Katavam, he celebrated Padala. None of them were from this country. Yes. And, uh, but he was able to give 
have very uh, reasonable interpretation or appropriation of these figures, which can be questioned based on historical uh, data. But what it did to Tamil society at that time yes. is very important. Where I find, say that you no, are no, less than uh, uh, charitable to these three figures, Trivika and and Mapus, for you know, transforming them from you know, from, uh, pre modern cyber holy person to a modern social religious. This is the order that we have. In fact, this is the Valar, I probably, this is the Valar which has brought so many people to yes. uh, uh, Of course, I am probably more stable in that case, but uh, the details of this approach, Yes. how do you know, summarize the details of that particular approach? Where do you think uh, they have been? Uh, uh, they are ignorant of the realized that debt to the civil genealogy and how that has affected a uh, real reading or a true reading of Yes, I would say I have, um, you know, I both Makosi and Tirivika um, read Valala very deeply. There is no doubt. I mean, they really read him word for word, and you can see it in their writing. And, but of course, they are also, uh, and they are very reverential. They are willing to take, uh, you know, his, and they are particularly uh, dealing with two very crucial factors in Balala's life which present problems for a kind of modern rationality. One is his disappearance, and second is all the miracles, and uh, particularly relating to the transformation of the body into this, uh, you know, the pure body. The body which vanishes becomes immaterial, and that's how Valala vanishes. They are not willing to abandon that. They are not willing to say, uh, in the Pakavanna, let us only concentrate on the one, the person who uh, appeals to the rational. But what does Makosi do? Uh, what does Tirunika do? He goes to Oliver Lodge and he goes to ether theory and he picks up on that and he says, you know, modern science is endorsing that. You can dematerialize and vanish. Uh, Mahabhusi uh, says, uh, uh, why not? And then, you know, actually, Gandhi article is well, it's a kind of a weird move. Like, but uh, they do all of that. But they, uh, and they read Valala, I think, with great sympathy. Uh, they, but, you know, they, they have. What is lost by not uh, knowing? The injustice that is. Yeah. Uh, what is what is lost is uh, that you know um, is that that you you don't fully understand Badala. I mean, at the end of the uh, the, the thing, I would say uh, uh, I would say telepathy that. But as you say, uh, 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 I know saints like uh, Malala in the district. Yes. So this man is unique. Yes, but for that very reason, you see, I think we we need to do justice to to his whole complexity, and by doing that, uh, you are you are getting the the bigger the the very rich and complex picture. Uh, which is only possible if you do that. How can we, un you know, how can we understand, uh, say, Ayodhya Das and Jiva Karunyam and Ayodhya Das without understanding how both he and Valala are coming at it from very interesting directions, and that Ayodhya Das is not getting it from nowhere. So uh, that brings me to the last uh, part of the conversation. So we. Uh, you you invoke the name of Ayodhya uh, Das and also yes. the uh, blur. Yes. Uh, in your system. Yes. Uh, and you say that you know, first, uh, uh, you know, outlet books uh, usually cost a bomb. 
almost impossible to afford. But luckily, I think you found the money for open uh, okay. access, so the book this can be downloaded. So please do read this book. I don't know what it is. Uh, I think you know. Uh, I'm sorry to say this, Ramlet has not given uh, the kind of uh, uh, attention and effort of this uh, level of scholarship deserves. I will say that. So the uh, uh, very interesting line it says: this book is a heartbreaking study. That's right. That also traces the common grounds between the religious missions of two of the most prominent subaltern figures of Tamil modernity, Ayyappu Das and Ramlet. Once again, the sequence is a book about Ramlet and about another person, but for some reason, yeah, yes, that is the yes. Okay. I hope it helps to you know get this book reach a wider audience. But uh, so I was very tempted uh, to. Uh, Find uh, the uh, the relationship between the yes. two and the that uh, section. In a sense, it's a very that's probably the smaller part of it. So it's just a section, right? Yes, why it is just a section. Why the uh, engagement of Nyaya Radical or Trivika or Mohusins of a very different order, yes. and it has been been given sufficient. Uh, yes. Uh, space in the book. So, why do you think, uh, what, what is the, uh, why do you think this is important to foreground this somewhat tenuous, like you say that Ram in the anticipated cycle. Yes. yes. Ayodhya does, as you can see, does not mention the name of Ram in the at all. Yes. Okay. So, uh, if that is the case, why do you think? This uh, tenuous relationship needs to be foregrounded. What is the uh, balance of it? What is the justification for it? Yes. When uh, I point to V. Gita sitting here, who again threw out to me, just as she mentioned to me, when the Ayodhya does Adivate Tenmo Jeeva Karuni and the Israel, and she said, I wonder where this comes from. So, of course, I'm like, you know, a terrier with a bone. I mean, the moment I hear the word Jeeva Karunyam, I just get excited. So, I immediately went off and um, picked up the Adi Vedam, started reading it. And then, what do I see? I see that, so before that, already I've been looking at a figure like Isu Satchitananda Swami, the same uh, contem older contemporary of, of Ramalinga. Who's written a work called Jiva Karunya Vilakam Svana Bhuti Vilakam? So he is, but his is a, uh, it's, it's a very long, say, you work, again about three to four hundred verses. But the word Jiva Karunya doesn't occur in the work at all, it's only in the title. But the whole, uh, the whole uh, work is very clearly a Shivana Bhuti work. And the Jiva Karunya is, then makes total sense, it's about the arising of Jiva Karunya once you become a Shiva Yogi. But Sachidananda Swami is from the Kuyava community. So you begin to, and then you begin to see that uh, why are figures like this suddenly writing about Jiva Karunya? Then you come to Ayodhya Das and you look at his, uh, you look at the list of works he's citing in uh, Adi Veda and you see. Uh, you're seeing this range of pre-modern works, Sitramala Nadi, then you're seeing Tattuvaraya, Perindirata, Kulindirata, you're seeing the Nigandas. Then you're seeing, yes, he is also looking for uh, some way of expressing a certain ethical visions, and he's going to a very similar or even the same corpus of works in some case, as uh, Ramal Valala did. Now it may very well be, and I would almost, I wouldn't know, but uh, why would he not have read Vadala, Jiva Karuni Olakam? He may have, but he does not mention him in that list. But it seemed to me that the very fact that this uh, incredibly, um, you know, uh, fascinating figure of Ayodhya Das is also then picking up on Jiva Karuni, but then of course he has a whole Buddhist framework of Metta and, and Maitreya and Karunya to place it in. Um, 
I think what I wanted to show was that, uh, you know, the mid 19th, uh, the, the mid 19th century onward, there is a moment in Tamil religious history where there is a there is a striving, just like with Ambedkar in Maharashtra, to try and and, and create a new ethic. And people are uh, people like uh, Ayodhya Das, though he's later, is going uh, to what he sees as the pre-modern uh, works to to extract something. So he does something very different. Uh, but the moment uh, the 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 blurb, by the way, was written by the Rutledge editor, whatever, and said to me, they obviously see this as a huge selling point uh, to see uh, to that that I have shown maybe that, uh, that any direct connection is non-existent when I say that, but suddenly you're seeing that uh, Ayodhya Das is picking up on a concept which has its origin in Tamil Shaiva Mandir and is then being, um, uh, uh, you know, deployed in ways uh, which are radical. And that is also a trajectory which has previously been undergone by Vandana. Uh, so I guess they felt, they felt that if, if, a, if this book has to sell more than 40 copies, they better that it better. So it is well taken, but I still do think that uh, you know this goes up to what I love the occasions. Okay. On that uh, note, I would like to open up the floor for discussion. Before I do that, I see a lot of young faces, which makes me really happy because usually the meetings that I go to, people are, the audience is much older than me. So there is more hope for the future. The reason why I point this out is this book is important for not only what it says, but also the many issues that it opens up. Each of it can be and should be at explored at length. Uh, my uh, uh, introduction is uh, questions were meant to you know, provoke you and have a lively conversation. So I do think it's very important not only to change the world, but first to make it better. And I think. Uh, once again, thank you very much for writing a very important book. Deeply interesting book. Something that opens up with closing arguments, something that opens up debates. And I really hope that the next generation will take up many of these issues. And I will say that that demands a great amount of hard work, linguistic uh, knowledge, and care with. Thanks. Thank you. I, I just want to add that not only is the work of people like uh, B. Gita, uh, Saravana, Pa Saravana, but also others I've mentioned, particularly I want to mention the work of Ira Rajashekharan, uh, who wrote, who's written this multi volume study of uh, uh, Shaiva Siddhanta institutions. Now, it's only uh, in Tamil, of course, and it's not well known outside, uh, you know, it's not well known uh, among Western academics. But uh, they, these are, you know, the importance of scholars like this in the Tamil sphere who are writing these really, really important works, but which don't uh, get an audience outside. and. I could not have written this book with, uh, except for the tremendous amount of groundwork and collation that some of these figures have done. I've tried to point that out in the book, um, and I hope that uh, in some way, sm some small way, it gives them the view that they richly deserved. I wanted to say that. So, as I wait for uh, the frame, uh, frame the questions, just want to add that. We make reference to G only in Ko only in the mid 80s. I used to meet him on a day to day basis. Uh, this is after I finished this book and he was writing the book on the And also, I, at this moment, I 
they call the English translation of Malala songs by M. Thangappa. You cite his uh, Sangam poetry yes. in the bibliography, but uh, Thangappa translated uh, Malala and it was published by the Aravindu Press in the mid 80s. The reason why I point this out is who is a kind of uh, Tagorean English, in the best sense of the word, not the worst sense of the word, to uh, interpret and present Wallala as this universal figure who has a message for him. But there is a movie in the middle book. Uh, okay, it's called the Songs of Grace. Yeah. I, I first just want to. No, no, you should have it so that she can respond. Thank you so much for anchoring this in the way that you did. It opened up many things of uh, Shilita's book. I just want to call attention to one detail perhaps that we may want to keep in mind. It's, this is also the age of missionary Christianity. And I think that's a very important aspect of the larger context in which Vallala was writing. And I think this is important for the last uh, <coughs> set of issues that you both were discussing, especially about why did people feel like forging this new ethic. And if you go back to Uran Adigar's biography of Vallalar, um, Vallalar's case for Jiva Karunyam also rests on vegetarianism. He actually re-deploys the story of Simon who became Peter in a very interesting way. The whole thing about you shall be fishers of men. And therefore, he says that even those who are habitually used to hunting, in which case he means the fishers, should actually look for other ways of making a livelihood. The Uru Narika's biography has that detail. Interestingly, Ayoki Taz also makes a case for vegetarianism. His Yuvakarunyam also includes this uh, vegetarianism. He also deploys the same story of uh, Simon and Peter. Obviously, that's the larger context because when he is redefining the Tamil Sangam universe, the fivefold division of the landscape, he talks about how Neither hunting nor fishing can be entirely justified and how you can scour the seas for the many other riches that you can discover there and make a living through trade, but not by killing the fish. So I think what's interesting is the very central ethical role played by Christianity, the ethical questions that it threw up at that moment in time. And Raj Gautam's book actually points that out in a very central way. Yes. Kanmodi Parvar Kamila Manmodi Poche, where he calls attention to the Shaping power of missionary rhetoric around violence, non-violence, killing, love your neighbor as yourself and all of that. So that's one thing. The second thing is, I think, the, um, the, for me at least, the interesting thing about um, Ayotitas is, Ayotitas does not follow citational practices that we would think relevant today. Uh, he was a very close associate of P. Lakshmi but does not cite him anywhere. Though a lot of the textual explanations of uh, Ava, or desire in the Adi Vedam, obviously draw from what Narasu himself had been speaking and writing about, but nowhere does Narasu mention it. So I think not mentioning somebody might not be yeah. to them knowing about these texts, yeah. because nowhere does he mention anyone else, but he mentions all these other source texts, which is interesting. Yes. So I think there is something that uh, he's picked up from Balala in a fairly straightforward genealogical fashion. But we can't, we can't replace it, nor can we prove it. And I think that's uh, because he does not use the word Okulu, which could have also been used instead of Jeeva Kavani, which is how Maitri has been translated in other contexts. He prefers to use the word Jeeva Kavani. So I think that's a very interesting kind of a thing. I think one of the mediating factors would be Christianity, which pushed both of them to write about it in very different ways. No, the other, I think, tremendously under explored a uh, person in the context of Jiva Karunyam is Peru uh, Santaling I think that uh, was, it emerges in the Kongal context, uh, actually Eric Steinschneider is now working on this, but Kole Maratil is a fascinating work which lays out the case for vegetarianism. And I'm sure both Ayodhya Das yeah, and that, that also influences Nandamani Swami, no? ah. who also figures in your book, but in a Yes. Only in relation to flower And But Dandapani Swami is again a figure I think one can spend a few years on. Absolutely. Amazing, amazing works. It's a, Satya Bajakam uh, is, a, is a remarkable, remarkable work. So there are 
other team, you know, the, I knew, I knew that if I decided to, I could spend another 30 years, but one had to publish the book at some point. I wanted my full professorship, so I had to publish So do you want to read what I What next? So that was my last poster to her, but uh, can we have more? Uh, just identify here, just your name and then yes. Who is going to be the mic? Thank you, Professor, for talking to you. So, if I have to be, uh, if I have to mention an anachronistic event like Anna Burai of Valala coming back, and if he was here, he would perhaps change his statement and say, Karai Yes, nice. Uh, so, I wanted, you, you spoke about how the Dravidian movement kind of engages not only with the social of mm -hmm. Ramalingam, but the hagiography and the miracles. But what about the religious and ethic of Ramalingam? Mm -hmm. So, for example, like, Bulal of Namai, for example, is like the base. But you we see meat eating parties, for example, with the Dravidar Kadak. So, how do they reconcile the ethic of Vandalar versus their uh, practice? That's the question, first question. The second question I would have is you know, uh, in the last statement of Vandalar, Karai Virton Padwar, and then he says, I'll permeate everything, something like that. Uh, do you see it in a theological and religious context? Would you see it as having, uh, having an Advaitic? Undertone, or is it kind of a prophecy that I shall come back again or something like that? How do we, how can we interpret that last statement of his? So, yeah. On on Dravidian women and meat eating, probably Jalapati is far more qualified to say something about how they would reconcile. I think actually, from my perspective, and in the last chapter I deal with that, I think they honed in on uh, on. Uh, Jiva Karunyam and you know taking care of uh, Pasipini as uh, and the caste thing as the pillars of uh, from which they could build a kind of progressive Shaivism and I think it has actually succeeded marvelously. I mean, if you're talking about a kind of a, um, uh, I, I think uh, you know my attitude towards this is yes. Uh, because this is what perjures and and you know if you want to start sort of arguing about no but Valala said don't eat meat and you know you're ignoring that whole aspect of it. Um, I think these are these are strategic appropriations but it's an appropriation which works because it um, so that would be one answer to that and thank God they do that actually. I mean thank God they don't uh, my attitude is even uh, this book is it's good it's come out in 2022 and not in 1876 immediately after Valhalla because what is happening immediately after Valhalla is placing them in Shaiva context. Kandasami uh, Mudaliyari, uh, they are all placing them in Shaiva context. Luckily, nobody reads them anymore or refuses to read them. It is it is disengaging from that context that has permitted. A certain consolidation that permits somebody like me to go back and say, but we can now take that as well, right? right? Okay. The second thing of yours about um, we don't even know what he exactly said. There are about five different versions of what and what he may or may not have said, right? Um, so, uh, is asking about the military aspect that you mentioned. Yes. Yes, I would say that uh, is it. Um, I'm I'm very hesitant to uh, to talk about this as Advaitic uh, because uh, Shuddha Advaita is not Kevala Advaita. I mean, we can go into the technicalities of it, but we are talking at an experiential level. Of course, he's talking, but then you know he's very clear that the Arupir and Jodi Andava. Uh, is not him. Uh, is, is going to come down and you know rescue everybody. So um, yes, thank you. You want to add anything to me? Just one line. Is that to say that Vandana has transformed many people at the personal level, and that includes activists of the family. So that is it. It's not just. Political, it's not just no. strategic appropriation. This reading here, or a certain reading of him, has a profoundly transformed. 
there are people, you know, there are people who follow uh, marriage rituals according yes. to one another, which of course we find that surprising for a man, you know, who, whose married life was what it was. Yes. I would definitely not only concur with that, but say that um, at a personal level, and my family can, I think, vouch for that. Uh, it has transformed me, leading Valala, because as they well know, my ability to toss out Jeeva Karunyam uh, regularly in my life, I mean, they are very familiar with that. I think that, uh, you know, you cannot read the Jeeva Karunya Urukam and not uh, feel its, its greatness and not somehow, you know, uh, carry that in, uh, even in your scholarship. And it just happens. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Vinay and I have two questions. The first is that in your South Asian Studies course, podcast, do you parallel like closely to Sardar Vallabhai Patel and Ramalinga where you talk about that? One parallel ah, yes, figure, that, yes. yeah, in the Raj Palkaran one. And uh, I think one parallel I find uh, and I'm sure you've looked at it is Sajanan Swami or Swami Narayan, the entire sect which builds up and it has close parallels because as by I've been looking at that material for a good while, I see vegetarianism, this idea of, I mean, the way they shape up Gujarati culture. I mean, of course, Jainism is already there, but the way even now Swami Narayan category of food also exists. So um, methodologically, did you find any parallels in that? Or say, would you, like, if we have to read it in a ra larger South Asian Indian context, uh, would you place Ramalinga along with, not along with, but say parallel to Swaminarayan, even though Swaminarayan is a little early, like 1782, 18... Yeah, he's prior. Like, yeah. No, in fact, uh, there is a book which does that. Uh, Rick Weiss's book is all about placing uh, Ramalinga within the socio-religious reform and modernity and modern Hinduism. And he has uh, done that, right? I have deliberately refused to do that. My point is that uh, it is that my point is to retrieve Balalas for very much a Tamil space. Mm -hmm. And for larger questions of uh, of uh, historiography and intellectual history. But it's not about trying to play because I think that uh, you know that is 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 uh, is really about the Hindu nation state. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's about the Hindu nation state. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not interested in contributing to that discourse. Mm -hmm. Very simply, but the book is trying to uh, really retrieve him for a much more quotidian Tamil religious space. Uh, so, I haven't bothered. To be honest, to look at any parallels with Sajan and so on. Though I must say, uh, uh, the fact that uh, there are parallels because Sajan and Swami's um, uh, very great familiarity with the Vallabhai tradition has not been researched enough. Yes, so yes. There, there is a very clear parallel. Now, uh, we need the uh, Sadar Patel thing. I mean, let's not get this. People will be wondering what the heck this is. I've not. Uh, in the podcast, I've said people get picked up within uh, regional nationalism or nation state national at various moments. Just like suddenly we are having a whatever 60 foot statue of Sardar Patel, where that wasn't the case 20 years ago. So that was the only. Uh, it is not, there is absolutely no way I'm comparing uh, Sardar Patel and Vadala. Um, and the second question is more to do with um, visuals in the sense that in your field work, which is the earliest dated or even undated, say, portrait or printed portrait of La Ramalinga you found, because as in the room when I was looking at the portraits of him, you see him seated as like these, like very classic Shaivite posture of like Shiva as the master of yoga. You see it in paintings, you see it in pre-modern sculpture extensively. And of course, I mean, Dr. Kashi Jain, your colleague would be another person maybe to speak to, but do we know how far and how does this portrait travel or have you, do you have any thoughts on that aspect in terms of which would be the earliest portrait you found? 
I'm not. Uh, there is. Uh, uh, I gave it to Harish for the thing. There's a. There seems to be a photograph, an old one. This classic iconography of Balala draped in the white and the head covered, either seated or standing, seems to come from that. But I have a marvelous anecdote again with Uran Arigal, because Uran Arigal. In his uh, Ramalinga Adigal Varvallar, the book is, is a great uh, book of hagiography on Ramalinga, writes very clearly about how a photographer came, tried to take photo of Varvallar, but it couldn't be captured, the image, right? He, so that's in the book. So Uran Adigal, when I visit him, says, takes me to his uh, private puja, And right there is a gigantic portrait of Balala with a moustache, right? So you can look, so this is a fascinating thing, right? You can look at this and say, but it, uh, he's written this, but there is that portrait. But I don't think that's a very effective way of looking at what is going on. Thank you. Madhavar's book read is an interesting uh, place to start right from his words. The interesting thing about Madhavar is not only really that you know so much, all the genres that you know yes. have survived. Poetry, prose, letters, commentaries, everything has survived thanks to the work of scholars and subsequent scholars. So, uh, on this note, once again, I share my happiness the fact that the, the, the very serious work of scholarship has drawn such a big crowd in the crowd of uh, young people. That is uh, very hopeful signs for the next generation of the scholarship. I want to underline this because uh, in these days of uh, you know transdisciplinarity, multidisciplinarity, we have to remember that no one has to be rooted. Students here, I want to teacher and speak. One has to be rooted in one discipline. The strength of uh, Srinivasa's uh, disciplinary training is evident on every page. So, more than the. Thanks for having me here. Let's go and tell us what it might be. Go to write a detective. <laughs> I think I'm looking at. Uh, I think I just want to look at some of the most neglected figures of Kalala's period. But we, I don't know where it will lead me. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.